Hey everyone, it's Adam again, and we're going to, uh, going to continue our talk of epi and biostats with talking about p-values and significance. Do you know why a uh, you cannot hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom? Because the p is silent. Anywho, um, we want to look at uh, understanding kind of what a p-value is and how we calculate one. Uh, we'll talk about the difference between one tail and two tail p-values. We'll look at some of the relationship between uh, how we can interpret p-values along with confidence intervals. And then we'll understand the significance of those confidence intervals, including uh, or excluding our null hypothesis, which we kind of talked about a little bit in the first lecture. And then we're going to be able to interpret results um, as to whether or not they're going to be statistically significant. Uh, and then we're going to distinguish uh, basically scientific importance versus statistical significance. Uh, we'll talk about power, and then we'll also talk about the concept of the equivalent zone. Okay, so first off, we're going to talk about what a p-value actually is. All right, so basically, um, if we were to, say, flip a coin 20 times, uh, and if we were to find that 16 of the flips led to heads and four to tails, how unlikely is that to have occurred? Right, so we assume that the probability, if you were to have an un, you know, an unbiased coin, uh, if you were to flip it uh, 20 times, you would expect to see 10 heads, right? And if you were to do that experiment uh, many, many times over, just kept flipping it 20 times and recording those results, um, you would eventually find, due to things eventually regressing back to the mean, that on average you would probably get close to 50%, right? Not every result is going to be like that, but you should be, you know, as you do the experiment over and over again, you should get close to 50%. And so the question is, what is, what, you know, what is the probability of getting 16 heads like we did in this first experiment? Okay, and so we can use uh, what we uh, are going to call p-values to determine how likely it is um, that uh, a value such as getting 16 heads, how likely is that due to random chance or is it likely due to something else? Okay, so we're going to see what that looks like and, and apply it back to the medical literature as we move forward. So uh, the assumption needs to be made that each coin flip is going to have a 50-50 chance on either landing on heads or landing on tails. And then again, we're going to be recording this accurately. Um, so again, uh, Harvey Dent need not apply when uh, doing this kind of experiment. We need real coins. Um, but basically, this is the null hypothesis. This means that basically uh, there's going to be uh, no difference here. Uh, it should be 50-50. There's not going to be anything that's going to skew uh, the coin flips one direction versus another. Okay. Uh, we expect the coin cost coin toss to be fair and so we expect this null hypothesis to be true there's not going to be anything that's going to skew this basically in most of these examples we're going to see that the null hypothesis is something that the researchers are trying to prove false um, and usually this is going to be that there would be no difference so for instance if i were to uh, say design a new drug uh, to treat hypertension my null hypothesis would be that if i were to give this drug to 50 people and i were to give placebo to 50 people the null hypothesis is that there would be no difference in their blood pressure after the experiment is done Okay, um, I want to disprove that because I actually want to show that that antihypertensive, that new drug, is going to be effective. So I need to reject that null hypothesis that there is no difference between those groups after the influence of the drug. Um, and so that's what we're going to be looking for when we're doing um, these comparisons of, of these null hypotheses and we're looking at our p-values. So um, looking at the coin toss again, since each coin toss only has two possible outcomes, this is kind of similar to um, our, our nominal variables, right? Because this is kind of a dichotomous variable, either heads or tails. Um, we would expect them to follow kind of a binomial distribution. Okay. So the question is, you know, with everything kind of, uh, you know, if you did this experiment a hundred times, uh, likely uh, it would be that you're kind of getting close to 50% heads. We want to see what is the chance of obtaining 16 or more heads. Okay, so the question ends up being, you know, if the, if the coin tosses are random and the answers were recorded correctly, which is what we're, our assumptions are going to make, you know, what is the chance? How likely is it that if you were to flip the coin 20 times, you'll observe 16 or more heads? Basically, the, another way you could say this is what are the chances that you would end up getting four or fewer tails? And the answer to this would be um, you would expect this to happen 1.19% of the time, right? So how likely is it that you would get a value at least that extreme uh, of getting 16 or more heads uh, is 1.19%. I'll show you on a graph what this looks like and it'll make a little bit more sense to you guys.
And so we call this a p-value, you know, the likelihood or the probability that we're going to be getting a result as, ex, as extreme or more extreme, or 16 heads or more. Uh, in this case, it would be 1.19%. Uh, another way you'd see it uh, described is 0 0.0119. Again, the same thing as, as 1.19%. So again, the p-value answers this question that if the null hypothesis were true, if we should expect to see a 50-50 chance of getting heads or tails, what is the chance of observing results as extreme or even more extreme, so 16 heads or more, as results observed for this one particular experiment? Okay, so if we were to look back to the medical literature, you're going to find that in general, we set our value of significance or something to become statistically significant and it has to be less than 0.05. So a p-value of less than 0 0.05 is going to be considered a cutoff level. Um, so in this case, because our p-value for the uh, the chances of getting 16 heads uh, out of 20 is 1.19%, and again, 0 0.05 is another way of uh, writing 5%, um, this would be considered to be statistically significant. Okay. So another way we can define this, again, null hypothesis is stating there's no difference in, uh, between population parameters amongst groups that are being compared. Okay, That means that if I were to see any observed differences, this is going to simply be a result of random variation in the data rather than an actual disparity in the data itself. So for instance, if you were to look back at um, you know, the example of uh, I developed a new antihypertensive that I'm going to give to uh, these groups. I'm going to have two groups. Both of them are hypertensive people at baseline. Uh, again, 50 of them are going to get placebo. 50 are going to get this new drug. Um, basically, I would say that there should be no difference between those groups uh, after I give them the medication in the, in the placebo. Okay, I should expect there, uh, and, and any differences that there are between those groups are purely just due to chance alone, right? None of it has anything to do with the actual the drug that I gave them. And so that p-value uh, is going to be this numeric representation of the degree to which random variation alone would be counting for the differences observed between groups or the data being compared here. So for instance, a study that finds that a p-value of 0 0.05 asserts that there's really only a 5% chance of obtaining a result as extreme or more extreme than that just due to chance alone. Right. So when we're saying that if I were to give this new antihypertensive to those 50 patients and I did see a reduction in their blood pressure. So when I start to compare these two groups, the placebo group had a higher blood pressure than those that received the drug. And once I do my test to see what the p-value is and say it came back at 0 0.03, then I would say that the, the extreme, you know, the, the differences between these two groups could only be due to uh, chance and 3% of the of time. So if I were to repeat this experiment 100 times, I would uh, potentially see this uh, result happen happen say only three times what that means is is that more than likely there is an actual true difference um, that is occurring here right so the actual true difference that the drug had a true effect here okay um, basically what you can say is that the smaller the p-value the stronger the evidence there is to dispute the null hypothesis to say that hey we can reject this that there is a true difference between these groups here the chances that this is due to just random variation alone random chance alone is so low that we can conclude that the null hypothesis is false, that there is a true difference between these groups, and we would call that to be statistically significant. Okay. So again, in our hypothesis testing, the p-value is going to be that probability of obtaining that test is at least as extreme as the one we found or something more extreme. Okay, And that's, again, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So when we do find this difference, when, once we find something that reaches that level of significance, which is going to be oftentimes called uh, our alpha level, uh, our significance level alpha, uh, once it gets less than 0.05, Sometimes you'll see that this level can be set differently, sometimes 0.01, but in, in general for the medical literature, 0.05 is considered significant. Um, anything that is lower than this would be considered to be a true difference in that uh, the, the, you know, the likelihood that it is going to be chance alone causing this difference is so low that we can reject our null hypothesis to say that there's no difference between the groups. Right? We say, yes, there is a true difference here. I reject the null hypothesis. So um, there can be a lot of confusion when dealing with p-values, but again, the p-value is not the probability of the null hypothesis being true, nor is it going to be the same as a type 1 error rate, which we're going to see what that is in just a second. Essentially, what we can see is that a type 1 error in statistics is going to be the incorrect rejection of the true null hypothesis, or in this case, it would be a false positive. So if I were to say, um, for instance, that uh, I gave this drug um, to the, this new antihypertensive to these 50 people. And if I were to, if there actually was no true difference there, but I were to incorrectly conclude that there was, that would be considered a false positive. And I'm rejecting that null hypothesis, even though it was true. 
On the flip side of that, we can say a type 2 error would be if we uh, run an experiment, we, we find no difference, but there actually is a true difference there, and we go ahead and re we retain the null hypothesis, but it's actually false, that would be considered a type 2 error. I'll show you a graph here in a second of what those would look like in more detail. So uh, some pitfalls of the p-value, um, this does not convey information regarding the size of an observed effect. I could have a change as small as one millimeter of mercury in blood pressure between one group versus another, and I could find a clinically significant, or I'm sorry, a, a statistically significant difference there. I could have a p-value less than 0 0.0001, um, but again, it does not have anything to do with the size of the observed effect. Um, and then again, a small effect in a study with a large sample size um, can have the same p-value as a large effect in a small study. So again, a lot of it goes back to the, the number of people you have and the actual effect size that you can see. We'll look at some of that math here in just a little bit. But again, the more variables or the endpoints in a study, the more likely that one of them is going to come up as statistically significant. And that goes back to that multiple comparisons error we talked about previously, where if you keep um, running different comparisons, um, and again, if you were to look at it, um, you know, in, in these cases, if we're using 0.05 as our level of significance, um, that means that one in 20 cases, we're going to find that these results are due to chance alone. Uh, if I were to do that, the, the same comparisons over and over and over again, I'm increasing my likelihood of finding a, a true difference when there isn't one really there. So I'm making a type one error in those cases. So again, if you were to look at, say, a distribution uh, of an experiment, say, for instance, I was to looking at um, the, the coin flipping experiment here, okay? So we can see here, if we were to look at the, the coin flipping, we can see that, hey, this would be considered 50%. So this would be 50% uh, heads. That's getting an experiment. This would be getting uh, smaller. So say maybe only 30% heads, 20%, something like that. And then uh, this would be a higher percentage of heads as we move over to, to the right here. What you can notice here is that at the mean, at the average here, this is where you're going to likely get the majority of your observation. So most likely, if I were to flip a coin 20 times, I would expect to see 10 heads. So this is the most likely observation. I might get like, uh, might get you know nine heads, might get 11 heads, but it should be pretty close to 50%. As you get farther and farther away from what the average is or what our null hypothesis is, you're going to get much uh, lower likelihood of uh, seeing some of these values here. So the likelihood of getting those 16 heads is pretty low. It's just going to be here on kind of the extreme. So what we're finding is what is the likelihood that we're going to find a value is extreme or more extreme than what we are able to observe with our experiment. So in here, that would be considered that p-value, right? So this is the uh, probability that this is just due to chance alone versus finding some actual true difference between uh, and being able to reject our null hypothesis, okay? So just know that this is where the most likely observations are going to occur. And again, this is with a normal distribution, that Gaussian distribution we mentioned a few uh, lectures ago. And then as we get farther and farther away from that, the values are less and less likely to occur because they become much more extreme in nature. So the chances of finding, you know, say, 19 heads out of 20 uh, would be very, very low, right? It'd be very unlikely to have that occur. Doesn't mean that it wouldn't occur just due to chance alone, but the chances of it happening are very, very low, okay? So uh, in this case, when you are looking at H0, uh, this is our null hypothesis, right? So this would be in the case that our null hypothesis is true, and this would be the case where our null hypothesis is false. And this is going to be on the kind of the y-axis here. We're going to see if we reject the null hypothesis versus if we do not reject the null hypothesis. So in this case right here, let's say, for instance, that our uh, null hypothesis is true. There's no difference between, say, two groups. So say, for instance, I gave that uh, antihypertensive to those two uh, placebo to one group, antihypertensive to the other group. And I were to see um, that, uh, that the null hypothesis is true. There's no true difference between the group. But I reject it. I find a difference and I reject that null hypothesis, we call this a type one error. This is a false positive error, okay? On the other hand though, if I had a, a, a null hypothesis which was false and there actually is a true difference and that the drug is having an effect on blood pressure um, and I reject that null hypothesis, this would be a correct decision, right? So the null hypothesis was false and I rejected it. That is correct. On the other hand, if I were to have a true null hypothesis and I do not reject it, so I find that, hey, it looks like uh, that there is no difference between the groups or that the drug had no effect on the patients, um, you would uh, make a correct decision here as well because I did not reject the null hypothesis and it is true. On the other hand, if I have a false null hypothesis and I fail to reject it, I fail to find a difference with the, uh, between the groups, this would be considered a type 2 error. This would be a false negative error. Okay, so it's important to keep in mind what a type 1 error, a false positive error is versus a type 2 or false negative error.
So looking at our body temperature example we talked about a few lectures ago. So again, we uh, hypothesized uh, that normal body temperature is going to be 37 degrees centigrade. Okay, so using our data uh, regarding the body temperature from our previous lectures, the mean temperature for those 130 people or the N of 130 is 36.82 we saw that the 95% confidence interval actually ranged between 36.75 to 36.89. One of the things you're going to see is that if your confidence interval does not overlap what you think is your null hypothesis, which in this case would be that the, uh, the average body temperature for people is 37 degrees centigrade. If this doesn't overlap, that means that you do have a statistically significant result. Meaning that if I were to apply this back, because again, my 95% confidence interval says, hey, I'm 95% sure that if I were to apply this data back to the population, their average body temperature would be somewhere between 36.75 to 36.89. Because this does not la uh, line up with what my null hypothesis is, I can reject the null hypothesis and say that yes, they're, the true average body temperature for the population is different than what I was uh, my, my null hypothesis was. So I would reject this null hypothesis and say yes, there is a statistically significant difference here. Okay. So um, the discrepancy here uh, from the sample mean and my hypothetical population mean is 0.18 degrees centigrade. And so when we were to find the p-value, the answer would be that if the population mean truly was 37 degrees centigrade, which is my null hypothesis, what is the chance that in a sample of 130 people that the absolute value of that discrepancy between the sample mean and the hypothetical population mean is 0.18 degrees centigrade or larger? Okay. So based on that, how likely is it to, I would find that difference or a larger difference between 37 degrees centigrade and what my sample mean was. And if you do a p-value, it would equal 0 0.0000018. This means there's a very, very low chance that this difference, that this discrepancy is due to chance alone. This would lead me to conclude because this value is less than 0.05, that there is a statistically significant difference between my sample, that 130 people and the average temperature that I found there, and then what my null hypothesis is, is that people, uh, the, the population average is 37 degrees centigrade, okay? Really small p-value says that if the mean truly is 37 degrees, there's only a very tiny chance that the, the 130 people that I'm looking at uh, would be as far away from this value as it was uh, or farther away, okay? So again, putting that p-value into context, again, um, you know, p-values always have to be interpreted into context. Just because something is considered to be statistically significant doesn't mean that it's clinically worth a hill of beans, right? So again, how firm in the first place is the data that the average temperature is 37 degrees centigrade? Is that just something that we just pull out of a book or thin air? I mean, is this an actually a good assumption? Perhaps our null hypothesis was not very good to begin with, and that would explain why we're finding this difference here. And again, what you'll find is the rule of thumb is not going to be based on an overwhelming convincing data, but rather tradition. So this is one of the things where we say, hey, average body temperature is 37 degrees centigrade. because It's a lot easier to remember that than 36.82, right? 37 is just an easier number. So this is a lot of times where you see a lot of these normal values come from, is from uh, being able to kind of get to good, easy, more easily mem uh, memorizable numbers or, or more round numbers, essentially. So this would seem uh, to lead us to believe that, you know, it helps us with the assertion that the true mean is probably not really 37 degrees centigrade, uh, seems a little bit more convincing, right? So, but again, we can use it as a general rule of thumb rather than use it as a clinical gospel, essentially. Now, on the other hand, if we were to look at the subset of 12 patients, right, so we have a smaller sample size here, we saw that the 95% confidence interval was uh, 36.51 to 37.02. Now, what you notice here is that we do have an overlap of that 37, so this overlaps with our null hypothesis. This would mean that if we were to get the p-value, we'd end up getting a p-value of 0 0.0687. Now, because this p-value is greater than 0 0.05, this would mean that we could not reject our null hypothesis, which this would say that um, the chances uh, of finding a result this extreme um, are uh, simply too high, too likely to be due to chance alone. Again, 6 point, almost 9% of the time we'd say, hey, this is just chance alone. And so because of that, we can't reject our null hypothesis. And so why do you think their uh, conclusions are different between the large versus the small study? 
Well, what you see is because uh, in the smaller study, we have a larger standard error of the mean because our sample size is so much smaller, our 95% confidence interval is wider. So that's why in a lot of cases, when you do a small study and you don't find any difference between, um, say, your study group and the control group or between um, what your null hypothesis about the population is versus what your sample is, a lot of times it's because you don't have enough people in your population or in your sample. Uh, and that is going to be a uh, reference back to a term called power, which we're going to look at in just a second. Often Sometimes studies are underpowered to find a true difference and so that goes back to having too small of a sample size. So the other thing you want to look at is whether or not you're evaluating a one tail or a two tail p-value. And so when you're looking at say at two groups, you have to distinguish between whether you're going to use a one tail or two tail p-value. So again, um, sometimes you'll see this referred to as one sided or two sided p-values. This is going to mean the same thing. They're synonymous. Um, and so again, imagine you're going to be comparing uh, the mean of two groups. So let's say we're going to go back and look at our blood pressures. Uh, the one patient uh, group got uh, the antihypertensive. The other group did not, right? They just got placebo. Um, and so we're going to see that the one tail or two tail p-value should be based on the same null hypothesis hypothesis. We're going to say that the two populations really are the same. And then if we observe any discrepancy between the sample means, uh, it's going to be due to chance alone, right? So one group gets the drug, the other group does not. The null hypothesis is that the drug's going to have no effect on their blood pressure. And that when we measure the before and the after, we really should see no difference. And if, we, if there is a little bit of difference, it's only going to be due to chance alone. That's our null hypothesis. So when we're referring to tails um, and, and p-values, essentially what we're going to be looking at is, this, again, the normal bell curve, this normal distribution curve. Um, we're looking to see like what type of values are going to be used to uh, essentially reject our null hypothesis. So say, for instance, you know we're going to be uh, evaluating um, the effect of caffeine intake, say, on throat cancer, right? So not something I know that has any kind of link, but just because we're coming up with a hypothetical. And let's say that the population average um, incidence of throat cancer is, say, like 7%. This is probably very high. Let's, again, this is all hypothetical numbers. And I want to look at the effect of caffeine consumption, right? Uh, I'm not sure if caffeine consumption is going to increase the chances or, uh, or lower the chances of throat cancer, right? So let's say, um, because I don't know that, I could say that values, uh, you know, in the extreme that say, for instance, you know, the, the value coming back uh, happened to be over here and it was uh, very low, say maybe only say 3%. This may be low enough based on the p-value that is generated here to reject the null hypothesis. On the other hand, say it came back and it was even higher. Say it came back and it was on, on this kind of spectrum here and it came back at 11%. This could mean that extreme values on either end of this uh, spectrum here based on caffeine consumption could lead to me rejecting the null hypothesis saying that uh, the null hypothesis being that uh, caffeine consumption has no effect on uh, the incidence of throat cancer um, and that any variation I see here is due to chance alone. Okay, uh, But I can reject that if I were to see extremes on either end and say, yes, that caffeine either has a uh, protective effect or it has a kind of a deleterious effect in increasing my risk for, for cancer in those cases. That's in the case when we would use a two-tail p-value uh, where extremes on either end could be used to reject the null hypothesis. On the flip side of that, um, I can use a one-tailed test or one-tailed p-value if I'm going to reject the null hypothesis based on results in only one direction. So uh, not the band, uh, but the one direction as far as difference between the, the kind of our standard population. So for instance, with the example of comparing a control group uh, getting placebo to the group getting an antihypertensive, I would not expect people getting the antihypertensive's blood pressure to increase. Right. So I really wouldn't be looking for extreme differences on that end because I just don't expect them to have an increased blood pressure. If anything, I expect it to go down. And because I'm expecting the, the blood pressure to only go one direction, I would really only be looking for significance on this end of the curve here. Right. Over on the lower end of the curve versus looking on the higher end, I would not expect their blood pressure to go up in these cases. So again, if you know kind of the direction um, that the uh, the intervention group or the the sample you're looking at should be heading, you can get away with using a one-tailed test versus using a two-tailed test when you're really not sure which direction is going to go. And this will have implications for what type of p-value is going to be considered to be significant uh, when we look at that in just a, a minute here. So basically my two tail p-value is going to answer this question of uh, that if I assume my null hypothesis is true and there's no difference between my groups or my, my sample and my population, what is the chance that a randomly selected sample would have means as far apart or further than 
what I observed in the experiment, um, if either group ended up having a larger mean, right? Because I can't really predict which group will have a larger mean in the first place, I'm not sure which one's going to be. So once I find a difference, what are the chances are I would have found a difference at large or larger? Um, and then when you're interpreting a one-tail p-value, on the other hand, though, you need to predict beforehand which group you're going to expect to have a larger mean. So, for instance, if I'm giving a anti-diabetic medication, I would expect that my intervention group is going to have a lower blood glucose. So I would assume that my control group, or the one that did not get drug, would have a larger mean, right? And so the, the one-tail p-value is going to answer the question that assuming the null hypothesis is true, what is the chance that that randomly selected sample would have means as far apart or further than, right? So the averages are going to be different there, um, observed in this experiment with my specified group. So the group I'm saying is going to have the larger mean. So in some cases, the control group, in some cases, it's going to be the sample group right or the population or, or the sample it just depends on what the, the experiment is set up as but what we'll see is if the observed difference uh, went in the direction predicted by the experimental hypothesis then the one tail p-value uh, ends about actually having uh, is about half of what the two uh, tail p-value is you know we're going to find that this is happens with most uh, but not all statistical tests so again um, you'll find that the p-value is going to be different based on if you're doing a one tail versus a two tail test so when is it appropriate to use a one-sided p-value? Um, this is going to be when, uh, you know, based on previous data or based on physical limitations or just based on common sense uh, will tell me, if any, uh, that the, the direction of my intervention is only going to go in one direction, right? Or if I know uh, previous experiments that caffeine has this effect on throat cancer, if I know it's going to go in one direction versus another, um, then I can just say, well, let me use a one-tailed uh, uh, one -tailed test or one-tailed p-value. Basically, um, you should only choose a one-tail p-value when one of the both uh, the following are true, that the predicted uh, you predicted which group is going to have the larger mean or proportion before you collected any data, right? So you decided beforehand, and this should be written out in your research um, or the, in the article that you're reading should be stated. And then if the other group had ended up with a larger mean, even if it's quite a bit larger, you have to attribute that difference to just random chance and call the difference not statistically significant. So even if it goes completely opposite and the, large, and the difference is, is huge, um, you still cannot say that it's statistically significant because you weren't really testing for that in the first place. Okay, You'd have to maybe rerun the experiment or, or do something like that in order to uh, show that there really is a true difference in the other direction. So a good example of a one-tail p-value uh, implementation would be, say, for instance, we were going to test whether a new antibiotic is going to impair renal function as measured by the serum creatinine. We know that there's plenty of antibiotics that can damage kidney cells that ends up resulting in an increased serum creatinine, and as a result of that, or also see a decreased GFR based on the calculations. Um, we know that there's no antibiotics out there that actually improve kidney function. Nothing out there is going to decrease serum creatinine or increase GFR. And so because I know that just intuitively, um, I'm going to go ahead and make this assumption beforehand. And I'm going to be able to say before I collect any data, I'm going to state there's one of two possibilities. One, that the drug is not going to change the mean serum creatinine in the population. Um, so that there's no difference. That would be my null hypothesis. And then the other thing uh, that could happen, the thing that would uh, cause me to to reject my null hypothesis would be if I found that the drug will increase the mean serum creatinine in the population. Again, um, I would consider it impossible that the drug would actually truly decrease the mean serum creatinine. Uh, and if I did find that, I would uh, have to say that it's just due to random sampling alone. I might have to repeat the experiment or maybe change the, the experimental design or something like that. So again, in this case, it makes sense to calculate a one-tail p-value because I would only expect the serum creatinine to either stay the same or go up. I would not expect it to go down, and if it did, it's only to chance alone. Okay, um, and so in this case, it's gonna you'll see that it is uh, the p-values tend to be lower when you do these one-tailed p-value tests, and it's gonna make it easier for uh, the the person to actually find a true difference there because the p-values are lower, it's gonna be more likely just to be less than 0.05. Okay, so we're gonna consider uh, we'll talk about uh, the robustness of statistics, um, but in, in some of these cases, if you were to choose a one-tailed p-value incorrectly, that may lead you to um, uh, find statistically significant differences that aren't truly there and you'd be making a type one error in that case or finding a false positive. So we'll find that in general, the two-tailed p-values are going to uh, be used more often than one tail for some of the following reasons. Uh, one, if we have a relationship between p-values and confidence intervals, it's typically going to be more straightforward um, with two-tailed p-values, uh, mainly because we know the confidence intervals can kind of go on either side of the, the sample mean that we're looking at. Um, so because it uh, tends to go on either side, if we're looking at two-tailed p-values, it, it tends to make a little bit more sense for us. Um, 
And then the two tail p values are typically larger. So again, if my test results are giving me something a larger p value, that tends to be more conservative, meaning that I'm less likely to find a true difference there, which means I'm less likely to make a type one error. Okay. In general, you'd rather make a type uh, two error and not find a difference if one is truly there than you would a type one error. You really don't want to say, hey, there's a true difference here when there really isn't one. Um, and again, it's one of those things where you may not ever know because you can't know what the actual true population mean is, um, but it is one of those things where um, you want to decrease your, your chances as much as possible. And so by using a two tail p value, this tends to be more conservative. Okay. Because again, not every experiment is going to comply with all the assumptions uh, that we were talking about previously about random sampling and things like that. And so by using a larger value, this is going to partially correct for that and make it so that we're less likely to make a type one error. And in some cases, you're going to look at some tests that compare, say, not just two groups, but say three or more groups. And so it's going to make that concept of tails kind of inappropriate. Um, and so you're going to find that these p values may actually have more than two tails. And so we're going to find that there's going to be some tests um, that are going to be useful uh, for kind of comparing those multiple groups. And we'll talk about those a little later. So uh, next we're going to move on and talk about statistical significance and hypothesis testing. Basically, uh, with a statistical hypothesis testing, we're going to automate the decision making following some of the following steps. So one, um, we're going to define a threshold p-value for declaring whether or not a result is statistically significant. Okay. What we're going to find is that in most cases in the medical literature, anything less than 0.05, again, that's going to be our alpha value. Alpha values in this case would be 0.05. We would consider to be statistically significant. Okay, uh, the p value is less than that. We have significance. Uh, if it is not, and that means we are not able to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, p value is greater than 0.05. You cannot reject the null hypothesis. P value is less than 0.05 or less than our alpha. You do reject the null hypothesis. So when dealing with hypothesis testing, I like to use the analogy of innocent until proven guilty. Uh, basically, what we can say here is that a presumption of innocence is the presumption that the null hypothesis is true, that there really is no difference between your groups until you can show that the evidence, right? Until you have facts presented and you collect data. And again, we're not going to be looking at outside information here. We're just looking at the, the information coming from our experiment. And we can see that a verdict of guilty occurs when the evidence does not support innocence, meaning that if I have evidence showing that uh, it is very unlikely due to chance alone that my null hypothesis is true, and that's signified by a low p-value, less than my alpha, and again, most cases less than 0.05, um, that would make it very hard to accept my null hypothesis and I would go ahead and reject it at that point. Okay. It's not necessarily that the verdict is innocent, it's rather going to be guilty versus not guilty, meaning that um, either I can make a, a no conclusion uh, that null hypothesis is true, because we're never really going to know whether or not it's true or not, but rather or not we, the evidence is going to help allow us to accept it or reject it. Because again, we're never going to know the true population values because we can never do that kind of experiment, but uh, we either have evidence that will help us to accept or reject the null hypothesis. And you'll find that this type of hypothesis testing can be uh, very common, uh, commonly used in quality control, but it's kind of rare to see it more in more exploratory research. Um, and the big thing is you don't want to get hung up on whether or not something is statistically significant, right? It can be kind of uh, counterproductive to reach a definitive conclusion um, just based on statistical significance. So yeah, there could be a statistically significant difference once I give this antihypertensive and drop in their blood pressure, but if it's only two points, you know, two millimeters of mercury difference, um, that doesn't really mean anything to me in a clinical sense. And so by looking at p-values and, and more precisely looking at confidence intervals, this can help us to assess uh, and, uh, the presented scientific evidence without really ever using that phrase statistically significant. Um, and so we'll evaluate this, especially when we look at journal clubs and, and things like that. Um, but it's important to look at the data and not necessarily the conclusions that the authors are giving you when you're evaluating that literature. You kind of want to be able to come to your own conclusion and then make sure that the authors kind of back that up. Because in some cases, you'll find um, that the data will say one thing and then the authors are concluding something completely different. So it's important that we as clinicians are able to spot those differences. So again, um, how significant is significant? Uh, you know, is a result of a p-value of 0 0.004 more statistically significant uh, than a result with 0.04? Uh, not really, right? I would say for the most part, uh, once you establish significance, it doesn't really matter how small the p-value gets. Um, you know, it does not necessarily mean the effect size is any bigger. It just means that the possibility that this result is due to chance alone is smaller or, or larger, okay? And so, um, you know, you'll find that most scientists are not going to be so rigid to describe uh, degrees of significance. Some of them actually use um, uh, what we call a, a Michelin guide kind of scale. So if you ever see um, something like a p-value, say, you know, p equals 
you know, less than 0 0.05. Sometimes what you'll see is uh, you know little stars, and that can denote different degrees of significance. So sometimes it'll be less than 0 0.005, 0 0.0005, 0 0.0005, whatever it happens to be. Um, so again, it, it doesn't really matter um, how small the p-value is as long as you get lower than that uh, a priori decided alpha level. Usually again 0.05. So if you have something that, say, is borderline statistically significant, does that mean that your results are completely, um, you know, uh, inconclusive? Uh, so say, for instance, we set our alpha at uh, the common value of 0.05. Does that mean that if I had a p-value of something uh, that reached 0.049, will that mean that that is uh, statistically significant, but 0.051 does not? Um, in a lot of cases, you're going to find things can trend towards significance. Uh, people use that that term quite frequently when something kind of gets really close to, to your alpha value, but not quite getting there. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that those uh, those values are completely invalidated. Um, you may just need to say run the experiment again. Maybe uh, this is one of those cases where you're not finding a uh, true difference, even though one is there. That might be an example of a type two error that you could be making in those cases. So again. Look at the p-values, but then you don't get too too hung up in, in those values. You know, just because something says 0 .0, you know, less than 0 .0001, um, doesn't really mean as much as you would see if something um, said 0 .01, right? So again, it's not how small the p-value gets, but it's again looking back at the clinical implications of this to see if it's really important um, in the clinical sense. So uh, again, when we're choosing a significance level, uh, you know, uh, the alpha is what we're going to be setting in advance. You don't want to do something where you get about all your, uh, you do all your uh, statistics and you get your p values and then you set the alpha value. You don't want to do that. You want to set it up beforehand because again, otherwise that can lead you to um, increased bias in, in your studies there. So one of the things you'll see though, is that if I set my alpha value very, very low. So say for instance, I didn't like that value of 0.05 because my chances of finding a difference just due to chance alone, you know, 5% is too too high. Okay, I can set that lower. I can set it at 0 0.01, and I'm very unlikely to make type one errors because if I find a value that is less than 0 0.01, then I know that the chances of that being due to just random variation alone are pretty low, which means I have a very low chance of finding a type one error or seeing a false positive. Right, so I have a low chance of rejecting that null hypothesis when it's actually true. The flip side of that is if I set my alpha value too low, I'm more likely to make type two errors. Or I'm going to falsely keep my null hypothesis, uh, even though there is a true difference, I just wasn't able to find it. Some people may err on the side of making less type one errors, but uh, in general, what you're gonna find is those alpha levels tend to be set at 0.05. Not a lot of people end up changing that very often. Because again, you're kind of walking a tightrope here where you don't wanna make type one errors, but you also wanna be able to find results if they're actually there and, and not make too many type two errors. So um, again, looking at a, a alpha value 0.05, there's a one in 20 chance that you're making a type one error when you come to these conclusions, right? So although similar to alpha, the p-value is gonna differ subtly because it actually represents that probability that the values that you found are going to be equal to or more extreme than that one uh, just due to chance alone, right? So this is just saying that, hey, I found this value uh, and this mean uh, and the chances that this is just due to uh, uh, you know random chance alone are going to be, uh, you know, if the null hypothesis is true, is this low? You know, was it less than 0 0.05 or less than 0 0.01, whatever it happens to be. Okay, and so you're going to find that the p-value is going to differ from one sample to the next, and we'll see that um, as we start to evaluate the literature um, as we go forward. So looking at our relationship between confidence intervals and statistical significance, a lot of times when I'm evaluating the literature, I don't even care to look at the p-values. I don't really need to because the confidence intervals are going to tell me everything I want to know right off the bat. So basically, when you get a uh, confidence interval that's computed, uh, again, this gives you a range that you can be 95% sure contains the true population value. And when we're doing our hypothesis testing, uh, this approach is going to compute a range that you can be 95% sure would contain the experimental result if the null hypothesis were true. Basically, this means that any result within the range is going to be considered uh, not to be statistically significant. Any result that's going to lie outside of that range is considered statistically significant. We'll talk more about this in more detail, so it'll make more sense to you in just a second. So going back, uh, we'll see in the next figure, this is going to uh, be looking at that, that comparison of observed body temperatures with that N of 12, right? And we saw that the, our hypothetical mean value of 37 degrees centigrade. We said that was our null hypothesis, so that is the average human body temperature. The bottom bar is going to show the 95% confidence interval of the mean, and that will be centered on the sample mean, right? So that, that N of 12. Notice that it's going to extend in each direction, 
uh, a distance that gets com uh, computed by looking at the standard error, the mean, times that critical value of the t distribution. You guys remember those tables? Uh, I'll show you an example of that again in a second. Um, but when you're again, you're using low uh, uh, sample numbers, so like an n of 12. Remember that you have to look at our degrees of freedom. So it's always going to be n minus one. So we'll look at that 11 degrees of freedom in this case. Um, but basically, what we're going to see is the top bar is going to show the range of results that would not be statistically significant, meaning a p-value greater than 0.05, and this is going to be centered on that null hypothesis. So this means it's going to extend in each direction exactly the same distance as the other bars we'll see. And again, we're going to find that the two bars have the same width but different centers. And just remember that we are going to use these uh, these t-tables uh, to help us determine what our what we need to multiply by our standard error of the mean, and this is going to tell us just how wide uh, those error bars are going to be when we're looking at our, our confidence interval. So in this case, when we're dealing with that n of 12, we would end up using n minus 1 or 11, so our 11 um, degrees of freedom. And if we want to be 95% confident that our results are uh, you know contain that population mean, we're going to use that value 2.2. So we basically just take the uh, standard error of the mean, multiply it by 2.2 and that would be my value. If I wanted to be 90, uh, have 99% confidence intervals, I'd have to multiply by 3. So you start to see how those bars get wider, the more confident I am, and the, the higher that degree of confidence. So basically what you can see here is that I have my null hypothesis. Again, on the x-axis here, you're going to have temperature, so anywhere between 36.5 to 37.5. And so looking at this, I see my null hypothesis, which is that the average uh, uh, population temperature is 37. And here I'm going to have my observed mean with that n of 12. Notice here the bars are going to be pretty wide because I'm dealing with this small sample size. And also my degrees of freedom are, are fairly low, uh, which means I have to multiply that standard error of the mean by a larger number. So I'm going to get wider bars there. Okay. Uh, so what we can see is because there's overlap, because my observed mean overlaps with my null hypothesis, I'm going to be able to detect here that because this includes my null hypothesis, that this is going to be um, unable to reject the null hypothesis in this case. So again, really just looking at this, because this has overlap here, my sample mean, my sample confidence interval, because of this, this is what I'm saying, this is I'm 95% sure that the actual population value lies somewhere in this range. Because it contains my null hypothesis, I cannot reject the null hypothesis because it's contained right there. Um, so because of that, I am unable to reject the null hypothesis, and I would uh, say there is no statistically significant difference between this group of 12 individuals and what my population uh, value would be. Okay. So uh, when a, uh, a confidence interval does not include the null hypothesis, and this is going to be shown when we're looking at that larger sample size, that n of 130, um, we're going to see that um, you know we're we're computing our confidence intervals in the same fashion. Um, again, we're looking at the standard error of the mean, we're looking at that t-table, but because we have a much larger sample size, that value becomes smaller, so closer to two. So that means our, our standard error of the mean is also smaller because we have a larger sample size, and the value that we're multiplying based on that t-table is lower as well. So you're going to see we have much smaller confidence intervals here, and this is where we're going to see that the confidence interval is not going to include our null hypothesis. So because of this, if you look to see what our observed mean is, and our null hypothesis, again, it's a very similar to what we saw previously. I'm sorry, I'm not using my laser pointer. So because we see what our observed mean is and what our null hypothesis, notice how the uh, confidence interval is going to be much smaller, right? Um, so because, in this case, it does not contain the observed mean uh, confidence interval does not contain the null hypothesis. In this case, I can say that I'm going to reject uh, the null hypothesis and say that the p-value here is less than 0.05. Okay. Uh, the reason why they use this top bar here because this is kind of what we call the zone of non-significance. And so in the last one, you saw that that actually overlapped um, with our observed mean. And so if uh, this bar were to overlap with this observed mean, then that would be considered non-significant, right? Uh, but there is no overlap here. Um, this bar. Uh, of my observed mean, the confidence interval does not contain the null hypothesis, which means I can reject this and say that a p-value is less than 0.05. I don't even need the p-value to know that it's less than 0.05 because of the fact that the confidence interval does not overlap with my null hypothesis. Okay. So again, like I said, I really don't need to see the p-value a lot of cases to know that the results are significant just by looking at the confidence interval. And you'll be able to do that too when you get more practice. So um, looking at this, we can see that uh, if a 95% confidence interval uh, does not contain the value of the null hypothesis, then the result must be statistically significant with a p-value less than 0.05. And again, once you hit less than 0.05, I don't really care what the, um, you know, I don't really care what the value is, I, I know it's significant. 
If a 95% confidence interval does contain the value, though, of the null hypothesis, then the results must not be statistically significant. Okay. So in the examples presented, that result represented the comparison of a sample mean with a hypothetical population mean. And so with a smaller sample size, you saw that we had a much larger confidence interval. It was harder to find significance because those error bars, uh, that confidence interval is so much wider, right? And so we saw a lot of overlap there. And again, this rule is gonna work for other kinds of data. So we're gonna see that if the confidence interval uh, is, you know, is looking at the difference between two means, does not include zero, right? Because we're doing the difference uh, between two means. Uh, I mean, the null hypothesis, because in those cases, if you're comparing two groups, your null hypothesis is that there's no difference between the two groups. If there's no overlap there, then that can mean that we have a statistically significant result, right? Or if we're looking at the ratio of two proportions, and again, we're going much more into this when we look at odds ratios and relative risk. If the confidence interval for the ratio of two proportions does not include one, which is in this case would be the null hypothesis because one divided by the other would just be one if there's no difference, then the result again must be statistically significant. Okay, we'll show over lots of examples of this in the future, so don't let this confuse you just yet. All right, so let's interpret a result uh, that is statistically significant. All right, so here we're going to distinguish uh, statistical significance from scientific importance or clinical significance, as I'll call it very frequently. So again, statistical significance only means that the calculated p-value is less than a uh, present threshold, right? And we set what that threshold is going to be or the researchers have. So the results will be surprising, but not impossible if the null hypothesis is true, right? There's still a chance that this could be due to variation alone, just due to random chance. Um, this does not mean that the difference is large enough to be interesting or worthy of follow-up necessarily. Okay, and it does not mean that the finding is scientifically or clinically significant. So um, in this case, uh, I'm looking at the result that is statistically significant when calculated uh, p-value is less than uh, preset value of alpha, or in this case, 0.05. So in my temperature example, when I was analyzing this, I wanted to see, you know, did the mean body temperature differ from that value of 37 degrees centigrade? With my end of 130, that p-value is very, very, very tiny, right? Very, very small, less than 0.05 by a large margin. Um, again, tell them large margin sent you. Uh, but the, the p-value is very, very small. It means it's very unlikely this is due to chance alone. But again, that difference between the hypothetical mean and the true mean was also very tiny, and that makes it of uh, very little practical importance. Again, um, do I really care that the value is a little bit smaller than 37 degrees centigrade? Not really. So again, even though this is statistically significant, doesn't mean it's clinically significant. Now, how about if we're interpreting a result that is not statistically significant? So not statistically significantly different does not mean no difference, right? So not statistically different, uh, significant here only says that the p-value is larger than a preset threshold and that a difference as large or what was observed would not be unusual just due to random sampling if my null hypothesis is true. This does not prove the null hypothesis is true. It just means that I cannot reject it with the data that I have currently. Okay. If you were to do the experiment again the same way the next day, you may find that you could reject it. Again, this is all due to uh, the uh, the likelihood that this is just due to chance alone. So, you know, a large p-value means that the difference as large or what was observed would happen frequently just as a result of random sampling. It does not mean that the null hypothesis of no difference is true. It just means you cannot reject the null hypothesis at this point. Okay. Um, high p-value does not pr uh, prove the null hypothesis. And again, deciding not to reject the null hypothesis is not the same as believing that null hypothesis is true. Again, if you try, try again, uh, maybe you'll find something uh, very different with those next results. Again, a lot of it could be just due to random sampling, random variation. So an example, looking at fetal ultrasound. So we have a study done back in 1993 that was looking at the routine use of prenatal ultrasound to see if this would improve perinatal outcome. They had two randomly uh, divided groups, two large groups of pregnant women. Uh, one received routine ultrasound exams twice during their pregnancy. The other group received sonograms only if clinically necessary. And then we looked at outcomes, uh, including adverse events, uh, morbidity and mortality to see if there's any difference there. In this case, our null hypothesis would be that uh, the risk of adverse outcomes is going to be identical in the two groups. It doesn't matter if you got two routine ultrasounds or if you only got them when clinically indicated uh, that the uh, the risk between the two groups is going to be negligible. And this is going to be a term we'll talk about later called relative risk, meaning if I were to divide the risk in one group versus the risk in the other group, it would end up being one, essentially, right? Because, uh, you know, 10% divided by 10% is still one. So in this case, when I was looking at the relative risk, I found uh, 1.02, meaning that it looked like uh, 
um, that there was a increased risk of, of um, bad outcomes in these babies by about 2%. And we did a two-tailed p-value here that ended up coming at um, a 0.86 and had a 95% confidence interval of 0.88 and 1.17. Okay, so looking at this, the data is consistent with the null hypothesis because that confidence interval includes one in this case. So because in this case that we had uh, this p-value, already know that 0.86 is not going to be significant because, again, we always set this at 0.05. And because our confidence interval ended up crossing one, because again, if there was no difference, the relative risk would be one. Because this crosses one, goes below A and above it, this would indicate that there's gonna be no statistically uh, significant difference between these groups, okay? So again, looking at this, um, we would say that, hey, we cannot really reject the null hypothesis. We can't say um, that there is a difference between these groups based on the ultrasounds that they got. Okay, uh, this does not mean the null hypothesis is true. It just means we cannot reject it. There could be some merit to doing more ultrasounds. Uh, there may not be, uh, but we can't tell based on the data we have here. And then when you're looking at the confidence interval, it ranged anywhere between 0.88, meaning uh, they had, uh, when they got more ultrasounds, uh, had an 88% uh, or as likely to, um, or they had a basically a 12% reduction in the number of bad outcomes, all the way up to a 17% increase in, in the risk of um, uh, of bad outcomes, right? So you can kind of interpret this in several different ways. And again, looking at this in, in the ultrasound, you can see here the routine ultrasound versus only when only indicated, looking at the adverse outcomes, right? And that's however they defined it in, in the study, uh, looking at the totals and looking at the risk, you can see here the risk is very, very similar between the two and this relative risk ended up being, and again, if you were to divide 0.05 uh, by 0.049, you'd end up getting this value of 1.02. So again, very, very small um, increase in relative risk that was found to be non-clinically significant. So there are uh, some approaches when you're interpreting these results. So again, the confidence interval is centered on one and is pretty narrow for the most part. So this usually means if you have a narrow confidence interval, that you can be pretty rest assured that the, the data is pretty close to what the actual uh, true value would be in those cases. Um, so again, this would show us pretty clearly that routine ultrasound is neither helpful nor harmful. The confidence er uh, interval is narrow, but it's not really all that narrow, meaning that it makes clinical sense uh, based on the ultrasounds we got that they could better direct care and improve outcomes. So if you catch things more frequently by doing more ultrasounds, then that could lead you to better outcomes. Um, because the confidence interval goes down to 0.88, this means there could be a risk reduction of 12%. This means that uh, the, uh, the ultrasound isn't proven beneficial, but it could lead the possibility that maybe um, you know, the bad outcomes could be reduced potentially. If you were to say, do this experiment again and maybe change something about it, you may find some, some reductions in risk, which is good. Um, but on the flip side of that, your confidence interval goes all the way up to 1.17. That means there could potentially be a 17% increase in, in problems. So in that case, would you think that does ultrasound increase your, you know, your risk of, of damage to the baby? It doesn't really make sense uh, based on what you know about ultrasounds or what you'll, you'll learn about them. And so again, this uh, kind of goes back to show that, hey, we can't really reject the null hypothesis. Um, chances are there's no difference between these type of groups and, and the type of ultrasound uh, methodology they go with. So again, uh, these type of things are gonna be open to interpretation. You may need to look at other studies that look at similar uh, patient populations or similar uh, interventions to see if there are any other kind of differences you may wanna look at. And then um, you know, looking at this, what benefits and risk weren't really looked at, you know? Uh, the reassurance of doing more ultrasounds and, and knowing that the baby looks good or increased bonding, you know, the mom seeing the baby, maybe that has some kind of, um, uh, some kind of beneficial effect. And then uh, early identification and intervention of problems that you discover by doing more routine ultrasounds. So again, a lot of these things go into kind of complex analyses, looking at cost and looking at potential benefits. And so you have to kind of consider all outcomes when evaluating these results and then applying them back to your clinical practice. So how do we get more narrow confidence intervals? Um, one of the things we could do is improve our methodology. They could help reduce the standard deviation. Again, that's a measure of the variability in the data that we're seeing about that mean. And so say for instance, uh, we increase the sample size, uh, that also helps to narrow down the confidence interval as well and say again, repeated study. Um, so even if we uh, increase our sample size by a factor of four or so, you would see that the confidence interval is expected to narrow by about a factor of two. Um, that's because again, it's gonna be inversely proportional to the square root of the sample size. So again, increasing sample size is always a really good way to narrow confidence intervals and make it more um, likely to find a true difference uh, should one truly exist. All right, so next we're gonna talk about statistical power. So what is power? This is gonna be the uh, ability for a statistical test. Uh, it's that probability that we can reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. Okay, so basically it's gonna be our probability of not committing a type two error, or in other words, making a, a false negative decision. 
Uh, basically, when you have uh, power or studies that are underpowered, that usually means they don't have enough people in the study in order to show a true difference if one actually does exist. And so if you find uh, results that show uh, or find a study that shows negative results, a lot of times they'll say that the study was underpowered and they didn't have enough people to really show a true difference uh, if one was actually there. And so uh, this is one of the, the other thing you have to consider in addition to your alpha level, that, uh, that uh, significance level, you also have to consider this beta level as well, or basically referred to as this false negative rate. And so power is gonna be equal to one minus beta, or AKA our sensitivity. So a power analysis can be used to calculate the minimum sample size required to detect an effect of a given size. So for instance, going back to that antihypertensive example, if I were to give um, you know, patients an a antihypertensive drug, if I want to show a difference in blood pressure uh, between them and the placebo group of 10 millimeters of mercury, then uh, knowing that effect size, I can go back and calculate a minimum sample size needed to show that difference. So you need to, uh, one of the things you want to look for when you're evaluating a study is did they do a power analysis? Did they try to show uh, that they calculated that minimum effect size in a study uh, given their sample size? And again, you can do that vice versa, um, where you can either, based on the effect size, determine how many people you need to show that, or based on the number of people in your study, what type of minimum effect size could you expect to see? So those are kind of two ways you can do that. And again, the concept of power is used to make comparisons between different statistical testing procedures. And we'll talk about this when we talk about parametric and non-parametric testing of the same hypothesis. Um, uh, briefly, parametric just means that we're dealing with normally distributed data or a Gaussian kind of curve. Non-parametric uh, test means we're dealing with non-normally distributed data or non-Gaussian um, uh, curves. And we'll, we'll talk about that more in detail a little bit later on. So an analogy to understand power, um, say for instance, you send your kid down to the basement to find a tool and she comes back and says it isn't there. Okay, so what can you conclude? Uh, can you conclude the tool is actually not there? Um, the answer is going to be a probability, right? So for instance, you know, you have to uh, question to the answer is going to be, well, what is the probability that the tool is actually in the basement in the first place? Or another way of uh, thinking about it would be that if the tool is really in the basement, what is the chance that your child would have found it in the first place? So to estimate that probability, you have to know kind of three things. So one, how long did she spend looking for it? And this is kind of analogous to the sample size. So a large enough sample size typically has more power and more ability to tr truly find an effect. So if the kid's down there for longer to find the tool, more likely are to stumble across it. How big is the tool? And hopefully you do not reference this back to me, but uh, this is gonna be analogous to the size of the effect AKA uh, an experiment um, has more power to find a difference if there's a big effect rather than a small one. So I'm able to find a difference in blood pressure of 30 points or 30 millimeters of mercury much more easily than I would find a difference of 10 millimeters of mercury. And then how messy is the basement? This is kind of analogous to our standard deviation or that experimental scatter. And basically an experiment is gonna have more power when the data is very tight or there's little variation. So the more tidy the basement was in the first place, uh, the more likely your kid was gonna be able to find it uh, in those situations. Sometimes when you're performing an experiment, you actually don't want to find a difference. Sometimes you're going to be testing for equivalence or for non-inferiority. Um, the thing, uh, this comes up most often for pharmacists when we're looking at uh, generic drugs, in, in which case you want to show that the generics are going to be just the same as the brand name drugs. That'd be one, one good experiment that would show there's no really difference. This could also be good if you were to compare, say, two different types of therapies for a disease state, um, and one is uh, much cheaper. You could show that, yes, the efficacy is the same between the two, but this one's cheaper, and that's the, the one that we should go with. So going back to our drug example, when we're looking at, uh, like, say, a new generic that's coming out for a brand name drug, uh, the FDA defines the true uh, drug formulations as equivalent when that ratio of their peak concentrations in the blood ranges between 0.8 and 1.25, meaning there's a pretty wide range there, where as long as the two drugs are shown to be within, uh, the generic is shown to be within this range of the parent drug or the, the brand name drug, then we would be seeing uh, that this would be considered non-inferior and they would be considered therapeutically equivalent. Okay, um, FDA would also specify that the entire 90% confidence interval, so not even a 95% confidence interval, should be within that range. So basically, as long as the 90% confidence interval, and again, as you get smaller confidence intervals, um, the more narrow your uh, confidence interval is going to be in those cases, right? Because you're less confident um, and that, that is absolutely true. And thus, you can kind of narrow those down and be more precise with those um, with that estimation. So again, as long as it's between this 0.8 and 1.25, then you're considered good to go and you're equivalent to the brand name drug.
So again, if you were to look at this, um, so if you had a drug that was going to be within this range, you consider it to be not, not equivalent. Uh, too high would be considered not equivalent as well. And it's going to be kind of the, uh, the Goldilocks uh, kind of uh, section here where it's going to be just right. So um, the next figure, I'm going to show data from three drugs uh, where the mean ratio of the peak concentration is within uh, that zone of equivalence. We're going to find uh, when we look at it, though, the drug A does not prove equivalence because we're going to find that um, the that 90% confidence interval is not going to be entirely within that zone. Um, but drug B and C will be proven equivalent. So looking at drug A, even though um, we have our mean value is going to be between that 80 and 125% range, uh, because the confidence intervals and the 90% confidence intervals kind of go on either side of this zone of equivalence, this would not be considered equivalent here. Whereas B and C fall completely within the zone, uh, so they would be considered okay to go. On the other hand, we would find that uh, drugs like D, E, and F would also be considered not to be equivalent, because again, F is just completely out, it's completely outside of that equivalent zone. But E and D would be kind of considered more inconclusive, and you may need to do con repeated studies to find if they, uh, this is just due to random variation, or if you would be able to find more uh, specific results if you did that again. All right, so a little Q&A real quick. Um, is the p-value uh, the probability that the null hypothesis is true? Is the p-value the probability that result was the, uh, or that the result was the result of sampling error? Does a high p-value prove that the null hypothesis is true? Can p-values be negative? Is a p-value always associated with a null hypothesis? So is the p-value the probability that the null hypothesis is true? This is incorrect. Uh, the p-value is it computed, uh, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So it's just trying to tell you that what are the chances that just due to random sampling that you would get a result this extreme or more extreme, okay? So it's not gonna be the probability that it's true at all. Is the p-value the probability that the result was the result of sampling error? No, the p-value is gonna be computed, again, assuming that that null hypothesis is true and that all differences that are there are gonna be the result of random sampling. Does a high p-value prove that the null hypothesis is true? Uh, no. A high p-value just means that uh, if the null hypothesis were true, it would not be surprising to find that result because it just could be due to random variation, right? Um, again, it does not prove the null hypothesis is true. It just says that you cannot reject the null hypothesis. Can p-values be negative? No, p-value is always going to be between 0 and 1. Again, 0% and 100%. And then is a p-value always associated with the null hypothesis? Yes. If you're not sure what the null hypothesis is, then you can't really interpret what the p-value would be in those situations. Is it possible to report scientific data without using the word significant? Is the concept of statistical hypothesis testing about making decisions or about making conclusions? Are the p-value and the alpha the same? And is the p-value the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis? So is it possible to report scientific data without using the word significant? Absolutely. Um, report the data along with the confidence intervals. And again, that's all, honestly all you really need in a lot of cases, but you can include the p-values as well. And then you can make decisions about the statistical significance. Um, you know, at that point, if you, as long as you include those values, you don't really need to say that the results are significant. The results speak for themselves in those cases. Uh, is the concept of statistical hypothesis testing about making decisions or about making conclusions? It's more about decision making. Uh, this system here of hypothesis testing makes perfect sense if it's necessary to make kind of a definitive decision based on just one statistical analysis. And then are the p-value and alpha the same? No, uh, alpha is what we're going to be setting as uh, our threshold for significance. A p-value is just stating, you know, what is the likelihood that just due to random variation, due to random chance, um, that we are going to get a result this extreme or more so from our, um, away from our, our population mean. And then is a p-value the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis? No, you can reject a null hypothesis even with a p-value um, less than alpha. All right, that cuts or that ends it for this section. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. See you next time.